morning congregation and welcome to worship this morning. This morning I want to start a new sermon series which I've called Look the Lamb of God and taken it from the Gospel of John chapter 1 verse 29. So as a call to worship this morning I read you from Psalm 143 and verse 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love for I have put my trust in you. Let us pray together. Dear God, we thank you that no situation is too far out of your control to provide. For you are Jehovah Jireh, the God who does provide. We thank you that you own everything and you hold everything in your hands. We thank you that you know our needs before we even ask, before we even come to you. You are aware of all that concerns us and you have a plan for us. You hold the provision, you have the solution. You alone can move mountains to make a way. We ask for your answer in your timing, in your plan, to be given for every need that weighs our hearts down. Forgive us for doubting you, for worrying and for trying so hard to work everything out on our own. Help us to trust you more. Help us in our unbelief. We choose to recognize and to believe that you are able to accomplish far more and do far greater than we even thought possible. So we thank you in advance for your miracles, for paving our pathways, for your provision for those who love you. Thank you for the abundance of blessing and goodness that you have stored up for us. We trust you this day and every day. And we are so grateful for your power and joy that fills our lives. Thank you for teaching us to be content in all circumstances. We love you, Lord, and we are leaning on you. In your name we pray. Amen. This morning's reading is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 19 to 31. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophets? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. May God add his word, add blessing to his word this morning. So our story starts this morning with John the Baptist, not John the Methodist or John the Presbyterian, but John the Baptist. Who was John the Baptist? Well, he was unique. He wore odd clothes. He wore clothes made from camel's hair. He was a wild looking man who ate strange, strange food, locusts and wild honey. John knew that he had a specific role to play in the world. He was going to announce the coming of the Savior. So John spoke with authority and people were moved by his words because he spoke the truth, challenging them to turn from their sins and baptizing them in the Jordan River as a, as a symbol of their repentance. They responded by the hundreds. But even as people crowded to him, he pointed beyond himself never forgetting that his, his main role was to announce the coming of the Savior. Of course, there's a history to baptism. First century Judaism, in that context, baptism had a different meaning. Jews had to cleanse themselves from ritual impurities, contracted through touching a corpse or a leper. And later Gentiles expressed their desire to convert to Judaism and priests broadened the rites meaning and along with circumcision performed baptism as a sign of the covenant given to Abraham. So you got baptized as a Gentile to become a Jew. So he got the nickname John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. 
want to move to the Gospel of Luke for a moment. Luke is very detailed and he, he tells us the story of John the Baptist from his birth in Luke chapter 1. Look at some of the details that Luke gives us in chapter 3. Luke 3 verses 1 to 3 and I'm just going to read a few verses. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So as a medical doctor, Luke knew the importance of being thorough. Luke thoroughly investigated the stories about Jesus. And what was his diagnosis? Well, it was that the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. So when we read Luke, we can read with confidence that it was written by a clear thinker and a, clear, a thoughtful researcher. Luke does not just say, close your eyes and believe, but rather check this out for yourself. Because your conclusion about Jesus is a life and death matter. This is Luke giving you the facts. This is history. Luke is the only gospel writer who related the events he recorded to world history. What Luke is saying is that what I'm about to tell you happened in history. It's true. This is significant and, and you need to take note. This is life changing. We're also told about the ministry of John in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 5. He writes, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Thousands of people came to the banks of the Jordan River to listen to his sermons and to be baptized. So John's role was that of a prophet. It was to encourage people to turn away from their sin and to turn back to God. And John was the first true prophet in over 400 years. It's often in that culture of the day, in context of the time, someone rose up and became a preacher People followed that person. And this disturbed the authorities of the day. So you can only imagine what a big deal that this was. John preaching and baptizing. A true prophet for the first time in 400 years telling people to look out that there is someone great about to come. Matthew 3 and verse 6 says, Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Now this was unheard of. In the first century, they had a very sophisticated system for how you confessed your sins. There was a way you did this. There was an order of things. And if you lived in the vicinity of Jerusalem, you went to the temple and you brought a sacrifice. You went to the priest, you confessed your sin, and did whatever you had to do to be forgiven. And here is a nobody in the middle of nowhere, and people are confessing their sins to him. Who is this guy? And not only did they confess their sins to him, but they were baptized by him. Matthew 3 and verse 6, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. The text tells us that he came. John 1 and verse 7, he came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. So what is John saying? John is saying that I got you before him, but he actually got you first. You've not seen him yet. But when he shows up, oh my goodness, John is saying, you better be ready. John the Baptist warns them that the law was given through Moses, but something new, something new is coming. John 1 and verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. Something new was coming. So the authorities go down to the river, they check on John and what he's doing, because as I said, every now and again, there's a one-to-be Messiah, and they're going to go and see if he perhaps is one of those. And they ask him who he is, and he replies, he did not fail to confess, but he confessed freely, I'm not the Christ. They asked him if he was Elijah, and he said no. They asked him if he was a prophet, and he said no. And finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer. What do you say about yourself? And he replies by saying who he is. He says, I am the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way for the Lord. He says, I'm just a voice in the wilderness. That's not where I am in the temple. I'm asking you to get ready for the Lord, to prepare the way for a king. Because, oh my goodness, when he comes, you better be ready. He is going to do something new. John is the prophet gathering the people. To get ready for what God is about to do. And what he is about to do is something brand new. Heads up, he's saying. 
Something great is about to come. Someone great is about to come. And oh my goodness, you better be ready. I want to read from Matthew 3, verses 7 to 8. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance? This is what happened when John saw all the religious leaders, the most religious men in the country. These were the law keepers coming to see what he was doing, coming to check on him. And he called them a brood of vipers. And he told them to change their behavior. And he challenged them and he reprimanded them. John 1 says, Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am unworthy to tie. Compared to whom is coming next, John says, I am not worthy. John says that he is not even worthy to perform the most humble task of unfastening the shoes of Jesus. Jesus makes his way down to the water and John baptizes him. And John says, I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. And as he baptizes him, something new begins. And this is what happened. This all happened, says John, at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John saw Jesus coming towards him. And this was a big moment in history and for Jesus. God in the flesh was about to go public. And John says, look, this is the one I meant. Not believe, not imagine, not pretend. John invites us to look. And everybody that day looked. And we look too and we say, look, the Lamb of God interesting that other translations use the word behold instead of look behold means to gaze upon to behold is to look to God to Jesus to gaze upon him John invites us to the story in this reading this morning to come and see to look to behold and this is the pattern throughout the gospel of John Jesus is always inviting people to come to see to encounter for themselves the life-changing work he can do in their hearts. When John, in John chapter 1, verses 35 to 42, when he saw and he was with two of the disciples and Jesus passed by, he said to them, look, the Lamb of God. And Jesus invited them to come and see. Further on in John chapter 1, he, Philip says to, to Nathaniel, when Jesus was approaching Nathaniel, come and see. The end of the gospel of John chapter 20 and verse 31. But these words are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that by believing you may have life in his name. So John throughout his gospel is at pains on every page to get you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. The one through whom you will receive eternal life. The Lamb of God and look at him, he says. When John uses this title, the Lamb of God, he has numerous pictures in his mind, no doubt. He, he, re, he recalls the Passover, when the blood of the slain lamb protected the houses of the Israelites. Maybe that John was saying, there is one true sacrifice that can deliver you from death. Jesus, the Passover lamb. The other picture that he had in mind when he used this these words, the Lamb of God, was that every morning and evening a lamb was sacrificed in the temple for the sins of the people. So John could be saying in the temple a lamb is offered every night and every morning for the sins of the people. But in this, Jesus is the only sacrifice that can deliver you from sin. Or John could be referring to the Old Testament prophets who spoke of the gentle lamb led to the slaughter. The one who by his sufferings and his sacrifice would redeem us, his people. So there is sheer wonder in this phrase, the Lamb of God. It's one of the most precious titles of Christ. It's in, it sums up for us the sacrifice, the suffering, the deep love of Christ for us. The Lamb of God. Look at him. The one who takes away the sins of the world. The one who lifts up and carries off. Who takes away our sins so that we no longer have to carry them. And everybody that day listening knew exactly what the point was of providing a lamb. The temple. The 
lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the people. They knew that. Look, the lamb of God. The sin. Can you imagine the scene? Can you imagine what is going on? God has provided a lamb in, in the middle of nowhere, not in the temple as he was supposed to. So let's remember this morning that we're all sinners. We all need saving grace. We cannot save ourselves on our own. We're powerless to do so. We do not look to ourselves. John tells us very clearly to look to Jesus, the Lamb of God, who can take away the sin of the world. Was God going to forgive the sin of the world? Not just Jewish sin, the sin of our enemies, the Roman sin. Seriously? The sin of the world? You can imagine the hearers of that word that day trying to understand this. But yes, Jesus takes away the sin of the world, not just of the church or a specific group of people. Remember in John 3.16, he later writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. See, the temple system was so corrupt. And Jesus came to bring something new. He came to establish a new covenant. He came to establish and introduce a new commandment and a new institution, his church. So Jesus takes over 600 laws and he reduces them to two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus starts something new. Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And if you are prepared to just look this morning, your sin can be forgiven. Something new can happen in your life. You will find a new commandment to live by and a new covenant to enter. And you will join a new movement called the church. If only you will look. So why not take a moment to look, to listen, to love the Lamb of God. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus as the true Lamb of God who has taken away all my sins. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God will go and be with you wherever you go. So Lord, with those words from Deuteronomy, as we go into a new week, another week of uncertainty, we look to you, Lord. We embrace your commands to be strong and courageous, not to be consumed by fear, nor to get discouraged, because we know, Lord, that you are with us. And so every moment of every day, we will look to you and wait upon you as you do something new. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen.